very much for allowing me to be here um, and paying for my ticket so I could come. Um, the hotel is beautiful, and um, you all have been so welcoming and so kind. Um, it's just a, a tremendous blessing. It's a blessing to get away as we drove from Boise. So one of the perks of me coming is we fly into Boise because we could either, I guess, either way it's about the same distance for a big airport. So we, we choose Boise because my father-in-law is there and my son and his wife. So we got to spend the night with them the first night and then we'll go back spend w one more night with them because our midweek service is on Thursday. So um, we'll fly back on Thursday and be back right in time for our online midweek service. <laughs> you have to be there, right? Um, and it's been, it's been a, let me tell you, it's been a crazy adventure. Coming from Papua New Guinea and moving to Washington, D.C., um, we've been there this month. It will be seven years, uh, no, seven years, six years since we flew away from Papua New Guinea and um, a few days in Australia. Um, we had a little layover in L.A., and then we made it to D.C. Now, our, our home church at the time was Treasure Valley Baptist in Boise, and our pastor there said, when you come, he knew about our call for over a year um, and was counseling us through the transition. He said, when you come back to America, it's going to be a big adjustment, um, and Idaho is completely different from D.C., <laughs> so you don't want your kids adjusting twice, right? So go directly to D.C., and then you can come visit us later, and he also directed us to uh, join a church in the DC area which he and my husband had been praying about we had visited on a survey trip um, so we land in DC with um, let's see we had nine of us we had nine uh, suitcases two guitars and a computer that's what we <laughs> landed with and I remember staying out it was sweltering hot which we came from New Guinea um, it's not too unusual um, and we had to rent a big van and we had a hotel lined up for two nights um, and we had no place to live. Our driver's license were expired. We didn't know that you could go online and renew them because that was a new thing. We'd been out of the country for quite a few years. So, I mean, incredible miracles God had to perform, and he did. So we ended up staying in a hotel for four nights. Now, we had a nice one the first two nights, and then my husband rented one room <laughs> for the next two nights because we didn't know how many, how many nights we'd have to stay, and we didn't have a ton of money, you know? And we had to rent a house and all that. So we all went into one room, and we just didn't let anybody see us. You know, we went in at different times. Has anybody ever done that? Can I, is there a confession? And there were only two kids or how many or four people were allowed to eat the breakfast, whatever it was, and we would transition after those two days, you know? And you four get to go this day. The rest of you have to eat cereal in the room. Anyway, the Lord delivered us from that. Maybe that was not even very ethical, but we did it. Um, and we got a house by Wednesday. We got a house. Can you believe that? Without, uh, you know, our, all the paperwork, what it was is it was one of those flipped houses that had been purchased by um, a new immigrant. And they didn't care about all the paper. We had saved up some money, and they wanted to just rent it out for three months. We had three months rent ready to go. They said, we'll take the money. We don't care who you are. And we got in that house. We lived there for a year, and that was in Virginia. And the Lord just opened doors like crazy. I mean, the way we got into Hill Center was a total miracle. My husband um, was looking for a place. So six months. We started the church six months after we landed in D.C. Um, and I should say the second Sunday, we joined the church. I felt like a, it was a mail order bride situation. The church didn't know us. We didn't know the church. My kids were totally like, you're still in, you know, I don't know. Like you landed on the moon is what it feels like. And um, trying to adjust, trying to understand American English, you know, and the nuances. Um, and it's just, we have some hilarious stories. But God opened the door and provided, and we joined that church. We served there for six months. They commissioned us, and during that time, you're preparing to launch a church, right? So you're getting all your, your website together, all your materials together. You're, we put out 10,000 door hangers, and um, we would go to the park and play with the kids and act like, you know, <laughs> we were from there, trying to act like we were from there. We looked so odd, I'm sure, but we tried to make friends. The first Sunday, we had some friends come and join, like from um, different churches, to encourage us. 
And um, I didn't even tell you how we got into Hill Center. That was a miracle in and of itself. We'll leave that for another day. Um, but we had about 60 people show up for our first service because of the friends coming from different <laughs> churches, but only four of them were from the area. But from there we started. Um, I think two of those people actually, or three of them ended up staying with us. Um, and God is just doing great things. We before COVID, we were running about 70 on Sunday mornings. So we praise the Lord for that. Um, a lot of transients. I mean, it's just, yeah. they come in for a short time and they're gone <laughs> and you, you learn to love and hate the military <laughs> because we are right there by Marine Barracks, Washington. So we have a lot of young men and our first years there, um, we were mostly a Marine church and then we had other young people, staffers that were coming. Um, and it, it was it was a blessing. We we decided we're going to play softball and get you know we got on the congressional league, which is a co they call it co-ed league where you have to have uh, men and women. We never play softball, but we didn't have any women in our church. So what do we do? We're church planners. We play softball, and I <laughs> broke my hand and blew out both of my knees, but I'm okay. You know you just do what you have to do, right? And we got the church started playing softball and whatever else you have to do. Of course, preaching the gospel school the whole time yeah. but giving the young people something to do and you have to create a community um, for the young people and here's the story and I need to get to what um, I think God wants me to tell you how much time do we have it's right here it's 11 20 you're good and I Keep have going. until uh, 10 11 till, we'll till 10 till yeah okay we're pretty good I'll just say this what was I I was saying um creating a community. Um, we do have some young people, I was talking to Megan, we have some, especially graduates of PCC and other Christian colleges that want to come to DC to make a difference. You know, they've taken the political science degree and you know, they really want to affect change in our nation. Um, but you get there and it's called a swamp for a reason. It's a very marinating environment. I mean, it's so nice. Everybody's professionally courteous and friendly and they you know, might have hideous beliefs, but they're so kind, mm -hmm. and it's hard to see beyond that. And young people want to get along with people, right? And so what ends up happening, um, they either don't find a church that reminds them of their church at home, um, and so they don't want to go, maybe sometimes they go to a church that maybe is not quite doctrinally cor correct, or they just don't go at all, mm -hmm. or they become assimilated into the what I would call the problem, you know, instead of affecting change. So the Lord has given us a foothold there to um, try to help conservative young people um, find a place where we have a community. We do a lot of social events, a lot of things. Um, well, before COVID, we did. Um, and that helps the young people have a community. So they're, it's not just go to church on Sunday or Thursday. It's, you know, some, something to fill the void in the evenings because they're there without their family you know, and, and for it to be an encouragement to them. So pray for us. We have seen souls saved. Um, one of my favorite stories is a, um, uh, a surgeon at Howard University Hospital, 65-year-old. Um, she's a black lady, if you don't mind me saying that. Just a beautiful woman, a marathon runner, head surgeon at Howard University Hospital, and she got saved in our church. We baptized her in our basement. Comes from a strong Catholic background. Were you for the, there for that, Debbie? Yes. It was so beautiful because her family was fit to be tied. She invited them to, she didn't tell them it was at a house. So her family arrives, and there's a, there's a historical church not too far from our house called St. John's. And they actually drove there first. They thought that's where she <laughs> No, over here. And they were just wide-eyed. They couldn't believe she was getting baptized in a basement. Um, but we, it was really pretty. I think it was pretty. And her, her sister almost fainted when she went under. Um, her, when Pam went under the water, her sister was just so overwhelmed that <laughs> she would leave the Catholic faith. She just fell down weeping. Um, and we haven't been able to reach her sister yet. We're praying that we can do that. But that's a huge blessing um, to see souls saved. And we've had a lot of Marines get saved. Um, and the ministry there is, is very, very um, fruitful young men there. Um, but I wanted to give you something that God's been doing in my heart through this, okay? And I hope it's a blessing to you. I see a lot of uh, more mature women here, and you should probably be up here. But God chose me, and my husband always tells me, don't discount yourself, as you heard in his message. So I'm happy to be here. But God has just been working me over. 
since we moved to DC. I mean, he has been, he does, doesn't he? He works us over. He doesn't want to leave us um, that way. And you know, you fill in the blank, whatever it is. Um, and I actually, this is not my own message. It's a message I heard, but it ministered to me so much. I was praying about what I should do. I took notes and I'm giving it to you. It's about healing a wounded spirit. And I have had some wounds inflicted um, during this time, and it's been so good for me, and God is giving me the victory. And it was interesting when I listened to this message, and it was just so random. I mean, it was a CD that a uh, pastor sent us. And we don't have a CD player in our home anymore. Does anybody have? <laughs> we don't. But I had the DVD players from our Rebecca DVD. Our kids do a Rebecca DVD program, if any of you know about that. And I just so happened to have it on my desk because I use it sometimes for exercise videos. And I thought, I wonder if CDs fit in this and if I can play them. <laughs> and I did. I listened to it, and it was like the Lord just put it there, put everything I needed right at my fingertips. And it was like he was saying, this is what I've been teaching you, and you're learning it. Now here's some structure, and you can hang on to this because we need it. In ministry and in life, we are going to be wounded. If you'll take your Bibles and just look at Proverbs 18 and verse number 14, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear? And we already prayed, but let me just say another quick prayer of, for help. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this time, and I pray that you would use this message as you did in my life. I'm sure there are some here with some wounds, and perhaps they're in the process of being healing, healed. Perhaps they've tried to cover them up, and they're festering, and they're creating bitterness. Father, would you show us what we need? And I pray that I could get everything said that you once said, and please mm -hmm. delete everything any unnecessary information. And I pray this in Jesus' name and for the advancement of his kingdom. Amen. Amen. So a wounded spirit who can bear, but a spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. Now here's some facts about wounds. Wounds are sometimes, and I would say often necessary for us to grow and to grow honestly, um, not in pride, not like a tumor or cancer. But to truly have growth, there must be pain. You know, no pain, no gain, right? If you exercise, you know that's true. And as you get older, they say you have to exercise twice as much to get the same results, which I don't do, so now we're going backwards. Anyway, <laughs> God's wounds, God wounds, but he also heals. And there's a lot in the Bible about wounds in a good light. Um, Proverbs 20, verse 30, the blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil. So do stripes, the inward parts of the belly. And, you know, when I was had little ones, we used that as, okay, sometimes corporal punishment is what, what needs to happen in order for them to be cleansed and to learn to not disobey mommy, right? The blueness of a wound cleanseth the way evil. God uses wounds in our lives. Um, the wounds of a, uh, of a friend, think about that, the wounds of a faithful friend. In Proverbs 27 and verse 6, it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And we all could use an honest friend, right? Someone who will tell us when we need something corrected in our lives. It's difficult to take, though, isn't it? Who likes correction here? Not I. <laughs> Um, and it's also, if you are in the position of trying to help others grow, there's sometimes when you have to say something difficult to someone and they don't receive it and you watch them walk away and it's, it's so painful. Um, but the wounds, uh, the words of a wise man in Ecclesiastes 12, it talks about the words of the wise are as goads. That's amazing, isn't it? And as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies holding things in. That's interesting, which are given from one shepherd. And if you're growing in the Lord, you're going to get difficult words, goads 
from different sources and don't become you know you're not my mommy you can't tell me what to do you're not my pastor I can't well obviously you need to listen to your shepherd first but it's one shepherd and that's Jesus Christ that's giving us these things from different sources and we need to be teachable we need to have a teachable spirit so wounds are part of God's plans now you can be heard at the house of God how many of you already know that <laughs> um, God's Word it's supposed to preacher mentioned it this morning preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine think about those three words reprove re re can you say that ten times yeah rebuke <laughs> and exhort two of those are negative reprove and rebuke and exhort of course it's supposed to be given with all long suffering and, and doctrine and the men of God are there to edify us not destroy us they're helpers of our joy um, and sometimes you know, they need to be balanced, I understand, and, and moms, we need to be balanced in that. We can just get reprove, rebuke, and we forget about the long suffering. Um, but two of those are negative. And so when we go to the house of God, we need to be willing to be corrected. You know, the, the last days, the sign is that, one of the signs is that they just have, they want teaching, having itching ears. They don't plan to change. They don't really want to be corrected. They just want to be told that they're okay and everything's fine. Um, that's not the way the Word of God reads. You think about the lazy man in 2 Thessalonians mm -hmm. chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. Um, he wasn't allowed to eat because he wouldn't work. How embarrassing was that when he went home to his family? You know, that wounded his pride. Um, what about the fornicator as well as a list of others in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? They were to be rejected. You were not to share a meal with them until they repented, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and included in that is a, it's incredible a railer a covetous man I mean we like to focus on that fornicator but what about these other things I mean there was some strict strict things given these are wounds to help them grow think about Ananias and Sapphira were they wounded at the house of God I mean they never got over it did they but it was their fault right um, they came and they lied to the Holy Spirit and God said you're not doing that and they just continued with the church service after Adam and I said, carry them out, keep going. I mean, what kind of a church was this? But it's in the Bible. Isn't that incredible? Um, the word of God is a sword. And when you're around it, you're going to get hurt. You're going to get cut, right? Now, you can be healed, though, if you will humble yourself. We need this. God wounds and he heals. Um, adultery causes a wound. In Proverbs chapter 6, it talks about a wound and dishonor shall he get. So there's self-inflicted wounds. There's um, things we can do to ourselves, and we need to be correct. When we humble ourselves, God can heal. His grace is amazing and overcomes all and repairs. And, and there's a certain kind of art, if you know about it, I can't remember the name of it, but they take broken pieces of pottery and glue it back together, and it's actually stronger than the original, and it's worth more than originals. And that's, I mean, God can do that in our lives. His grace is incredible. And there's providential wounds, too. I mean, think about Job. God took everything away from him. And even his wife said, curse God and die. I don't blame her for saying that. She gets a bad rap. She had just lost 10 children, buried 10 children, lost all their income. And, you know, she was at, at her limit. Thankfully, he didn't listen to her at that time. I think about a family I know, um, the Rowley family, and they were pastoring in the north, and they went to Florida for a conference. Um, and some of their children were already um, outside of the home, so they just had two daughters with them in the car. And then, so they switched drivers. The mom was going to drive through the night, and the dad, the two children were in the back. The young, two young ladies, they were in their teens. And the daughter told me the story. She said, we woke up. We didn't even know what had happened. Mom had wrecked, and she had flown outside of the car. The, the ambulance took her to the hospital. They drove to the hospital. And the doctor comes out and says, your mom died. Oh, no. And she's a teenager, you know. And I, I looked, I knew this family very, we were very close to them. And it was overwhelming. And Brother Rowley depended on his wife. You know, there's some pastors who can do it all. And then there's some pastors who probably wouldn't be in the ministry if it wasn't for their wives. This was one of those situations. And he went through so much after that. I mean, I look at this and I couldn't see good. I could not see good that came out of this. Um, his, his brother Rally made some very bad decisions right after because he was so lonely and he was so broken. 
and their children were in a, a time of a lot of confusion mm -hmm. and darkness. But her daughter, the one that told me the story, um, is in Papua New Guinea as a missionary today. Mm -hmm. And she sat there. I, I've never seen anybody who, when you read the, the Bible, we would have devotions. You know, they came to work with us for a few weeks on our station. And we would have um, some kind of devotions together in the morning um, before we went to work. And all of us, all the missionaries. And she would just weep reading the Word of God. She loved the Word of God. And she mm -hmm. said, you know, if my mom, I don't know why God took mom. I don't know why. But I think one of the reasons is that I look forward to heaven and I view all of life through eternity. Mm -hmm. And God is using her on the field. And I don't think any of the children are better. The dad went through a horrific time. I think he's finally coming out of it. Um, but the kids, I think they all made it from what I know. They're all serving God. Mm -hmm. And God does these things. You probably have stories in your life. The pastor who preached this message had a family who um, lost their their son, a four-year-old son who had drowned just last September. Mm -hmm. and, and from no fault of anyone, mm -hmm. it just happened. And he said, you know, they're going, the, the parents are trying to figure out, you know, what did we do where the dad is really struggling? The mom has been given grace um, to get over it, but the dad is just really, why I should have done better. And, and I loved what the preacher said. He said, there are things that happen that you, could, you can't do anything about. Mm -hmm. It's a wound that God has inflicted or allowed and what are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about it? Um, he, these are the points that he gave. First of all, do not demand to understand. Mm -hmm. You just some things we're not we're not going to understand until we get to glory. He's the one working the tapestry, and he can see the design. We're down here with the tangled thread, saying, "Lord, what are you doing? <laughs> I see gold over there, but <laughs> it's not over here right now in my section." Um, but do not demand to understand, and don't bow the knee to bitterness. Mm -hmm. Bow the knee to God. <coughs> don't bow the knee to bitterness. Um, and, and realize this. No one gets off this globe without scars. Mm -hmm. and, and the devil wants you to think you have it worse than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And you just focus on that thing that hurt you. But everyone gets scarred in some way. Um, and a wounded spirit, it says our, our text, a wounded spirit who can bear. You make life miserable for everyone around you, and there's times to heal. You need to, that time of healing. It might take years to heal certain things. It might take, you know, seemingly most of your life to get over something, but allow that healing process to happen mm -hmm. um, because you become unbearable when, in, in, when you can't allow God's healing in your life, right? So there's a time to grieve, but then you have to get over it. And I had something happen in my life that I cannot disclose, but it was, it was a, a huge endeavor in my life, a huge thing in my life, and that's what God's been working on me about. Um, and it had to do with, it was connected to my past. And sometimes you don't even know the things that, that you know, happened in your past, how they just suddenly like spring up, in, especially when your kids become that age. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and so then you see it and you can get better about what happened and allow that to resurface or you can allow God to heal you. God helps you. And I want to tell you this. I don't want to die a bitter, old, angry woman. I don't want to. God, please keep me from that. And, and I pray. We're one of our dear members, um, his wife is in assisted living. She's um, at the final stages of Alzheimer's. And it, we helped care for her as long as we could. They don't have no children. And so uh, the, our deacon's wife and, and myself, um, we were there and we, both of us have prayed about the end a lot more than we ever have. Um, Lord, help us. I mean, I don't know, spare us from becoming bitter, you know? And I don't know how much of that is just chemicals going on raging or how much of it is issues that haven't been de dealt with in the past. But as long as I have my faculties, I don't want to be angry and bitter. I want to be healed. What is amazing grace about if it doesn't heal, right? It's amazing grace, and it can heal anything, okay? So let's not be a victim. Um, don't blame others for your spirit or attitude. We have to take responsibility for our own spirits and attitudes. And don't punish everyone else for one person's wrong. <clears throat> You allow God 
to do that. Now, here, there's quite a few. How many of you are pastor's wives here or full-time minister's wives? Ministry can he, uh, wound you. Ministry can really wound you. My husband, what he said about the deaf, I always get it mixed up with the deaf eye. No, the deaf ear and the blind eye, he tells that to me because I have struggled with that more than he does. It's hard for me to let the little things go, you know, the little things that are said to you and maybe... You know, somebody who means well, they have no idea what you've been through. You've been up almost the whole Saturday night preparing for Sunday morning, and you're really not in charge, you know. <laughs> they may think you are, but you really aren't. <laughs> you are submitted to someone who may not have noticed this or that or the other thing, and he may have had you doing something else. So let me just encourage all of us to be careful with our words. We don't know what other people are going through, um, but we need to get healing before we destroy the work of God. Because I know pastors' wives can end up destroying the work of God. And I pray about that all the time. Lord, help me not to become the problem at Graceway. So we have a solution. There is a solution. It's so simple. And we know it. Um, go to Exodus chapter 15. And um, we'll start reading in verse 23. So as we... As we turn there, just think about this. Stop living in denial, okay? Ask yourself, who wants to be around me? If nobody wants to be around you, um, it may not be that you're just an introvert. It may be that you actually have some emotional healing to do. Um, Abigail was really glad, actually, when her husband died. It appears so, because she got married right away, right? There was relief there, not grief. And I don't want to be <laughs> people saying, whew, you know, crying at the funeral and then rejoicing afterwards, right? Um, so we need to work on this and not live in denial. Uh, Exodus 15, verse 23, And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. God led them there. Think about that. He led them. This is right after they crossed the Red Sea. Right after Miriam went out with the women and they were celebrating the great and grand victory, they were led to bitter waters. How are we doing? Okay. Good. Um, Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. So God does allow us to go to bitter places. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, a specific tree, the only tree that could heal bitter waters, um, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. And that's what this is about. God's trying to give us statutes and ordinances. He's trying to give us things that we cling to in order a process of healing that we understand so we can help other people. And he wants to prove us. Mm -hmm. He's trying to grow us. We cannot grow honestly without pain. So we have to have some pain, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and he said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, will give ear to the commandments and keep all the statutes. There's a great list there that we could go through, but um, let's just continue. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Is that Jehovah Rapha? Does anybody know... Je is it? I was trying to remember, it, and I, for some reason I was so tired this morning. It's Jehovah Rapha in, in Hebrew, isn't it? And um, I, how many of you pray through the names of the Lord sometimes? I do that. Um, get a list of it. Jehovah Shammah, I know the Lord is there. The Sh Jehovah Tzidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. And, and, and find those places where that's mentioned in the Bible. Claim those promises. Um, it's a blessing. But this is about healing. And I don't know about you, but that emotional healing is, is it, you have to have it. Yeah. You have to have it to continue going on. It's the only remedy was this tree, and we know what the tree represents. It's the cross. And we, we say that, we know that, but what did Jesus do? What were his footsteps leading up to the cross and on the cross that will teach us emotional healing? <clears throat> let's, let's try God's way. We've tried our own way, and it's not working out so good, right? Um, let's try God's way. And, and remember, you know, we know life is hard, but let's... let's not be hard ourselves. We don't have to be hard-hearted. And this is how the cross worked for Jesus. I'm going to give you three points and we'll be finished. He had a submissive will. Did I say that right? He had a submissive will. Mm -hmm. Through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. 
So don't just, it's not just getting down on your knees, okay, Lord, whatever you want, but you're not reading the word and pouring over the word and asking the Holy Spirit. There will come times in your life where you have to lay before him and say, God, you said that you could heal me. You said your grace was sufficient. This pain is unbearable. Do a work. And God has done work for me when I had no strength. I mean, there have been times since I've been in D.C. I found myself in a closet not wanting to see anyone, just mm -hmm. like wanting to hide from life because of pain in my life, from issues that I hadn't dealt with. And God wants me to grow. He wants me to get past this and truly live in that 1 Corinthians 13 charity, that love that, that can overcome all pain. Um, you think about Jesus in Matthew 26, 39, and he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed and said, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup, this bitter cup, like the waters of Mara, pass from me. But what did he say? Nevertheless, not what I will, but as thou wilt. This happened to me as a teenager. And, you know, there's, there's different increments of growth in your life. It happened when... I wanted to do something, and my um, ministry-wise, I wanted to go on a missions trip. It was actually in John Day, Oregon. We were in a little church there, and I was like 14 or 15. It was the first time that I ever fasted, and my dad was in evangelism, so we were ministering at that church, and I fasted that day. I thought I was going to die, but I didn't, and I went into a Sunday school room, and I wanted to go on a missions trip with other young people. I didn't want to stay with my dad going to little churches and who knows where, where there's no boys my age, you know. <laughs> you know, you know how it is. That was the truth. But I was wanting to be a missionary, right, so, <laughs> in my teens. And I went into a, a Sunday school room and there was a Bible. Like, I'm borrowing a Bible from this church because I brought a tiny little Bible that I can hardly see anymore. I left my big Bible at home. Anyway, there was a Bible like this in a, a Sunday school room, and I went in there, and I said, Lord, just show me what you want me to do. And I opened the Bible, and there was this verse underlined, as a bird that wandereth from her nest, so is he that wandereth from his place. <laughs> so God still speaks, right? But I wanted... <laughs> I wanted what I wanted. So that was when I was in my mid-teens. And then, of course, the whole thing of waiting on God to bring the right one. And I, there's a place in New York um, up there near Rochester where I laid out in a field and said, Lord, all that you want, please. Because I'd already made, like, I know he's the one. And my dad said he's not the one. And that was a difficult thing. And I surrendered that bitter cup and drank it. God gave me my husband. <laughs> but that doesn't always happen that way, but that's the way God worked in my life. But think about Jesus. He was falsely accused, he was abused, yeah. and he was assassinated, and his father allowed it. Um, he said, not as I will, but as thou wilt. We were, um, for a while at Hill Center, it's just a community art center. So people use, this is where we meet. And so one Sunday, we are packing up our stuff, and the... Um, atheist anonymous or whatever they're called <laughs> were coming in to use our room after us it's so interesting i mean the list of who's there you know la leche league the buddhist meditation grace way baptist church and alcoholist anonymous we're all meeting at the same time um you really feel like you're going into the world when you go to church you know, there's it's not like you can get away from them. they're right there but i was talking to ladies we're moving out so they can move in and we got talking about why she was an atheist and she said i cannot understand you know, I believed when I was younger, which is also a, a lot of atheists have mm. believed. Agnostics are more ones that never believed or never were raised in Christianity, but many atheists had been, and they got angry with God, and they didn't get healed, and they ended up leaving. And she said, I, we used to say, you know, God knows why this little boy died, and he allowed it, and how can I be, believe in a God like that? Now, I didn't get a chance to minister too much to her because they were moving in, and we had to get out of their <coughs> way, but it, the anger that was there, um, she did not like that God was in charge, and sometimes he did things that she didn't understand, and so she just decided that he didn't exist, and that is what happens when we don't, you know, we might still be a pastor's wife, but we don't, when we don't acknowledge the power of God to heal us, we're basically saying he doesn't exist. He can't heal me. So we're a practical atheist in that, in that area, right? So we have got to get a hold of the fact that he's real, he cares, and he can make a difference. Um, 
Watch your tongue. This is just an added note. You can wound de deeply, as the book of James says. So Jesus was falsely accused. Let's not enter the work of the devil and become an accuser of the brethren. Mm -hmm. First point I gave you, he had a submissive will through the power of the Holy Spirit and the word of God. Number two, he considered the ignorance of those who hurt him. And sometimes it takes a while to get to this point. You've got to say they know not what they do like Jesus said we're talking about the tree that you cast into bitter waters okay the tree is the cross well how does the cross work first of all you have to bow before the king yeah. and say I don't understand read his word believe his word trust his Holy Spirit and say I don't I don't I don't know but not my will thine be done and then consider that the person who hurt you didn't know did not know how much they hurt you you have to consider that. That's what Jesus did on the cross. Enter in. By his stripes we are healed. He had, to, he had to let that go and leave that with the Father. Hard hearts are incapable of knowing how much they hurt other people. They are just simply incapable of that. God can work and change them, but in the, process, in the meantime, allow him to change you. And you get freedom. Don't allow them to become your captor. So consider the ignorance of those who hurt. He, this is what he did. He considered the ignorance of those who hurt him. And then number three, he prayed for them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And, and we switched the order there, but um, it, all three points are there. Have a submissive will. Consider that that person just has no idea how much they hurt you. Mm -hmm. And then pray for them. Yeah. And you have to say it by faith. Maybe the first time you can barely get it past your lips. Mm -hmm. Lord, pray for this person just give them to you and then as you pray he will enable that forgiveness think about Ephesians 4 32 what does it say and be kind one to another forgiving help me quote it tender-hearted tender forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you did I say all the words that I remember them all <laughs> I have a little girl in my church that likes to help me remember them so I need your help um, but it's it says even as God for Christ's sake hath given you it's it's appropriating his sacrifice to to your situation you might even want to kill that person sometimes in your mind you might want to you need to allow the death of Christ to be sufficient for even that sin he by his stripes we are healed and remember Job's captivity was reversed when he prayed for his friends so when there's an issue where you've been wounded and you, you can't forgive, the real captor, you've heard this before, the real captor is you. Because that person may not even know what they did. They may not even, you know, they're so far from God, they can't understand. But you're still holding what you think the jail cell are guarding the jail cell and then you when you give it up to the Lord you realize the door opens and you walk out it's you who were in that bondage not that person who did it to you perhaps um, so pray so the three points about how does that tree work to sweeten our bitter waters give your will to God and that is sometimes the hardest part um, through the power of the Holy Spirit it's definitely the first part and the Word of God Consider the ignorance of those who hurt you and pray for them. And remember the, that the cross means a whole lot more than salvation. It means salvation, but it means healing for your life. It means victory for your life. Maybe we should say it this way. It means salvation for your life and every part of it. It means a whole lot more than, oh, I just asked Jesus in my heart and now I'm going to heaven. It means you can live in victory. You can live in grace and in healing. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this message. I hope it spoke to someone's heart and can help them. I know when I heard the message, I wept so loud that my daughter came in and asked me if I was okay. I didn't realize she could hear me because I had headphones on. But um, it was such a powerful message in my life, and I pray that it could be a blessing to someone else. Lord, if we want to see our nation healed and we can pray like 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, humble ourselves, 
uh, pray, uh, seek your face, and turn from our wicked ways so that you could heal our land. Certainly, we need healing ourselves first. Mm -hmm. Physician, heal thyself, and that's what we need. Lord, we are to be the ambassadors, the ministers of reconciliation, and if we are not reconciled, how can we help others? Mm -hmm. So I pray that you'd show us. Lord, there's things in, in my life you've showed me in the last two years, mm -hmm. and it has been a painful process. I pray in Jesus' name, as you have healed me and continue to do so by faith, I declare it, um, that you would do the same for these beautiful women, um, that they might see your grace and that they be able to comfort others with the same comfort that they have been comforted with. And you love us. Help us to live in that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was so wonderful. Yeah. I think we all can say we've had a time and maybe in a time right now because that's just our lives as ladies. Thank you so much for listening and thank you, Mrs. Wells, Deborah. It was wonderful. Yes, it's <laughs> okay, so to do this, so we have some time. I'm going to have the pastor's wives go to the table first and uh, go back here and get your cup and your journal. So if you want to get up and do that, please so that we can get 